For $8,000 a session, you can inject a teenager's blood and it actually can reverse the color of your hair from gray back to its normal color. And that's exactly what tech billionaires are doing. At the same time, unicorn CEOs are getting caught for taking a little too much LSD at work and getting removed from their company. But they weren't taking it to go on a trip. They were doing something called microdosing to get a creative edge. It's safe to say the tech industry is hyper competitive for everyone. And when it's sink or swim in the startup world, no risk is too big to take. Today, we're gonna pick our poison because we're talking about smart drugs in the tech industry and how workers are trying to use them to get ahead. We're gonna go deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole of smart drugs. And I wanna be very clear, we're talking about a lot of controversial stuff in this video. Some of it's illegal and many non-peer reviewed and anecdotal studies. So I absolutely don't endorse anything in this video. We're gonna start out with the mainstream stuff, a handful of biohacking techniques that will make your life better. Then we'll dive down the smart drugs rabbit hole. Everything from stuff you probably don't want to mention at work to the stuff that'll get you fired and beyond. And finally ending up in the billionaire danger zone. So this is how programmers and other tech workers are using smart drugs to hack their brains. Whether you go to the gym or not, most people have a specific reason for doing so. Some want to look jacked and post pictures on Instagram, claiming they do it to get women, but most of the comments are guys. Other people have some vague notion of health or living longer. But if you ask a tech worker or programmer in SF why they exercise, you might get a very different answer on average. Many would probably cite increased mental performance as one of the reasons. And if they give you this answer, chances are this isn't the only thing they do. Within tech culture, many follow the lead of CEOs and influencers influencers doing everything from cold plunges to intermittent fasting, daily saunas, or all the above. This is also known as biohacking. There is one major issue. They're hard to do. Nobody wants to jump in a cold shower at 7 a.m., but everyone wants to be that superstar at work who creates the next unicorn, becomes a 10x programmer, which brings us to the first real level of smart drugs, which I call soft nootropics. But first, really quick, if you're learning to code and feel it's harder than it should be, drugs probably aren't the answer. Realistically, you just need a bit of guidance and motivation. So as a five-year software engineer, I've decided to start connecting one-on-one -on -one and sending people advice emails for free. Just fill out the form below, let me know where you're at, and I'll respond. First come, first serve. Anyway, back to the video. Now the weirdly spelled word nootropics or nootropics comes from the Greek word which means to bend or shape the mind. And we define soft nootropics as the over-the-counter ones that you can buy online or in a box subscription like Nootrobox. This is in contrast to hard nootropics, which we'll talk about next. There's Onnit, which has been promoted by Joe Rogan and Bulletproof Supplements as well, created by the infamous biohacking guru, Dave Asprey. Now the thing about these soft nootropics, whether you're talking about supplements, reishi mushrooms, ginkgo herbs, is that some people swear by them taking up to 50 plus a day or others claim they do exactly nothing. The only people winning for sure are the people selling these supplements from the founder of Nootrobox's mouth. Patient. Scale of one to 10, how much smarter do you feel on nootropics? 10. Now, even in the soft nootropic world, people have serious doubts. And that's why when Nutribox went on Shark Tank, they got rejected. But the more common sentiment, especially among people who take them, is the trade-off that if it works, there's a huge upside, but there's probably little to no downside, so what's the hurt? In summary, soft nootropics are probably fine, if not completely ineffective. The main thing you gotta be careful of is turning into this guy. the right pills and the right brands. He showed us his morning routine. He takes more than 60 supplements a day. So I do about... Now we're gonna talk about hard nootropics, also known as study drugs. The distinction we can probably draw here is that hard nootropics are usually synthetic and have some side effects, even if small, so they're not quote unquote free. The first and one that's probably been around for longest is called paracetam. It's a white powder that's been around for decades and a derivative of this gave Soviet cosmonauts an extra focus boost before they went into space. Still, paracetam in the world of hard nootropics is on the better side, meaning it's not as strong and has less side effects. So many people see it as kind of a pure win thing to take. 
That said, on the other side of the spectrum, there are two more familiar players, Adderall and Ritalin, which are prescription only for ADHD. And as we're well aware, these are habit forming and amphetamines that work according to WebMD by increasing dopamine, a feel good hormone and norepinephrine levels in the central nervous system. Now, what we're mainly going to talk about is somewhere in the middle of paracetam and Adderall, and it is called modafinil or Provigil, which is a relatively new entrant to the market. The reason we dwell on modafinil is because it's many people's drug of choice in the tech industry because many claim it does not have the same downsides of Adderall and Ritalin, particularly not the addictive qualities. Allegedly, it's what the drug NZT from the movie Limitless was based on. Take that for what it's worth. TechCrunch had one conversation with a Silicon Valley executive who said he uses modafinil to work 20 hour days. Now, if you go over to Reddit, r slash modafinil, things are overwhelmingly positive perhaps to a fault with one guy actually saying it turned him into an extreme extrovert from an introvert and made him really good with women. Who wouldn't want that? But slow down. As the first comment says, you are probably having a manic episode. But there is an alternate community called r slash Afinil, which is a bit more balanced with discussions like this one about one of the purported downsides of Modafinil, which is whether it actually blunts creativity with many comments conceding that it's not actually great for high level problem solving more repetitive tasks. That said, the narrative doesn't fully align with this lack of addictiveness. And in particular, many find to build up a tolerance to modafinil very quickly, and then subsequently experience withdrawals as this user on Quora did. Another user on Hacker News started to get very extreme side effects after taking it every day, namely irritability and insomnia or not being able to sleep, which in turn gave him hallucinations, which is actually no surprise. Prescription uses is to treat sleeping disorders. What we do know in the short term is you're basically trading some creativity and higher level thinking for machine-like efficiency, especially on repetitive tasks. And that is the one thing Modafinil, Adderall, and Ritalin do have in common. Many sources say that they do reduce memory and brain plasticity, aka creativity. For creativity, many have a different solution. That is microdosing LSD or mushrooms. If you don't know, microdosing is taking a small, almost unnoticeable dose of psychedelics where you almost can't even feel the effects. Allegedly, this produces a very different sensation than taking a full dose, where you're still completely tethered to reality but get euphoria, focus, and other creative benefits. Forbes tells us that Silicon Valley's had a long history with psychedelics, like LSD, going back to the 60s, and since then having many entrepreneurs citing them as a source of creativity. Bill Gates and Steve Jobs have both publicly acknowledged experimenting with LSD with the late Apple co-founder, describing taking the drug as one of the most important things in his life. Microdosing really came into the mainstream in the late 2000s, due in part to Ayelet Waldman's book publication, A Very Good Day, How Microdosing Made a Mega Difference in My Mood my marriage and my life, which was a memoir of a month of microdosing. Since then, r slash microdosing on Reddit has exploded. There have been a lot of personal accounts and anecdotes and casual studies, including one in the Netherlands, where a participator said that a microdose of mushrooms makes his brainstorm sessions yield more concepts, ideas, and solutions, partially because it lets him better visualize things. With another user describing something very similar with all ideas connecting together in a visual tree shape. Curiously, brain scans actually showed a similar pattern with different regions firing in a connected in sync way that they didn't normally fire. The results of this group study in the Netherlands showed on average that participants created more out of the box solutions for a problem, but the microdose having no impact on fluid intelligence. On Reddit, many of the top posts make jokes about taking too much and going to work and seeing dinosaurs, which is funny for sure, but depending on your job, that's maybe not a situation you want to be in. This became very real for the CEO of a multi-billion dollar startup called Iterable, called Justin Zhu, who was actually removed and fired after being caught for microdosing on LSD. And he stated he was doing it for performance reasons, experimenting to boost his focus and creativity. But naturally, what more people are concerned about than getting caught is, does it affect your brain long term? So on one hand, you could say it actually makes you smarter or able to see reality more clearly. But on the other, you could say, well, hey, maybe this is disabling or altering 
key functions that the brain is supposed to perform. Naturally, having doses laying around could also be a direct precursor to macro dosing, which is potentially more harmful. Now let's move on to the final frontier, the newest, the most controversial and most expensive. All of these fall into the anti-aging category, which is growing by almost 10% every year with clinics appearing nearly everywhere in the US. And no, by anti-aging, I don't mean Botox. We're talking prescription pharmaceuticals, some of which you can't even get in the US at all. The famous ones are testosterone, HGH, peptides, and similar compounds that were only used by bodybuilders. We all saw Jeff Bezos transform himself into Mr. Olympia as soon as he was single and we enjoyed memeing him for doing so. But he's not the only one. Venture capitalist Peter Thiel, co-founder of PayPal and first investor in Facebook, he stated he takes human growth hormone daily in hopes of living to 120. He told Bloomberg that HGH helps maintain muscle mass, so on one hand you're less likely to get bone injuries and arthritis. It also makes your skin look firmer and younger, and it does this by stimulating cell growth and repair, which also operates on our internal organs and our brain. Therefore, it's directly related to mental performance. This is why a San Francisco doctor specializing in hormone therapy has had a rapidly changing patient base, increasingly shifting towards young male tech workers who told them they're more interested in cognitive enhancement than looking younger. Infamously, HGH also makes all cells grow, meaning it also makes cancer cells grow faster. So if you get cancer, you have less time to catch and treat it. But Peter Thiel, when asked about this, is confident we'll have a cure for cancer soon enough. The other one worth bringing up is having blood transfusions from teenagers put in his veins, but this was debunked slash still not proven according to this TechCrunch article. Even though you could have these transfusions done for 8K a pop by a company called Ambrosia, they, they got shut down in 2019 because of, you guessed it, no long-term studies or FDA approval. But hold on, set aside the stereotypes about evil tech billionaires and blood plague doctors and listen to this. Studies on mice about young blood transfusion have been extremely promising. In a 2014 Harvard study, when young mouse blood was injected into older mice, it improved their muscle mass, cognitive ability, basically all of their organs, and even reversed their hair from gray back to brown. Naturally, it sounds pretty dystopian to harvest a young person's blood, but hold on. Imagine being 20 and being able to make one to $2,000 per week just for selling blood. But just imagine being 70 years old and this being a viable treatment. You can criticize it and call it evil or get a little bit of blood and feel like you're 30 again. With that being said, we could talk about CRISPR, another edgy biotech startup. We could talk about stem cells, but that's a whole nother rabbit hole. But this video is getting long, so I'll ask you this instead. Do you think any of these smart drugs actually have an advantage bigger than the downside? And do you agree with this statement that we didn't evolve to live in this digital world? So naturally, we need a little bit of help. Let me know what you think in a comment, and I'll talk to you next time.